Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. We had some technical difficulties. You know, the guys I brought on, they were struggling with their, their headphones, so we were a little bit delayed. <laughs> now, the truth is my, my headphones weren't working, so I had to restart the computer. Thank you guys for waiting. I appreciate all of you that are in the waiting room right now, those of you jumping on that are spamming my chat and breaking my chat bot. Thank you guys. I'm with my friends here, Remnant Radio. How are you guys doing tonight? How's it going? Good. Good. Yeah. Fantastic. Good. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have We're you guys great. on. It's going to be a great night. I've been on their show a couple times, and I thought this would be the time to bring them on. So we're excited. I know everyone on YouTube is going crazy here, saying finally you guys are collabing. We have collabed in the past, just not on my channel. So excited to have them on, and we're going to be talking about a good, a good and interesting topic, which is deliverance. This is episode 168 of the Revival Lifestyle Podcast. Do me a huge favor. You guys know I live in Facebook jail. So share on Facebook, like on Facebook, comment on Facebook, get us out of jail. I don't know if you guys know, but the like button, it's not going to hurt you. It costs nothing. It's free 99. Do us a huge favor, like and share. It means a lot and helps us on the algorithm. And I'd say this every time. I'm not going to waste my time, our precious talk time on the liking and sharing. Just do us a favor and like and share. We really appreciate it. And then I'll say this last thing, and then I'm going to introduce them. Their channel is linked in the description. So I already know you guys are going to spam. What are their names? Their names are on screen. All you got to do is look at the screen and you'll see their names. So not only are their names on screen, and then you're going to say, what channel do they have? Their channel's in the description. So if you type, put the little more button, you'll see their channel. Make sure you guys subscribe to their channel. Really appreciate them having me on their channel. I'm glad to have them on. So let's get started. I'd love for you guys, since it's your first time on the show, hopefully not your last time, maybe we'll go Josh Lewis, Michael Miller, Michael Roundtree, and we'll start with you, Josh. Just a little bit about who you are, maybe like a two-minute version of your testimony and what Remnant Ray Radio is, and then we can kind of jump into the content. Yeah, so I was a uh, uh, raised Christian home, uh, always believed the Lord existed, uh, believed in the Trinity, understood, but I kind of felt under the weight of the kind of perfectionistic kind of lifestyle that was placed in front of me, kind of kind of crushed under that weight a little bit. I uh, had an encounter with the Lord, changed my life, uh, ended up in a Bible school uh, under Steve Hill's ministry, if you're familiar with the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida. He moved in 2000 to Texas, planted a Bible school and a church. I attended both that church and that Bible school, uh, really on fire for the Lord, I was doing evangelism inside of public high schools, uh, seeing 90 to 300 kids in public high schools uh, doing evangelism. So saw a lot of really cool stuff, then uh, moved to be a youth pastor for a little bit, I was an associate pastor, did a lot of web and graphic design, and then started Remnant Radio in 2017. Awesome. I've kind of been all over the place. I was raised in the classical Pentecostal church, hung out in the Anglican space for a little bit, and then uh, kind of hung out with these uh, theological outcasts. Uh, so we're, we're kind of little black sheeps, uh, kind of hanging out in this r odd middle ground that is word and spirit, hanging out in this place where we really want to believe and pursue passionately in spiritual gifts, but we also want to be tethered and grounded uh, in the word of God. So we started Remnant Radio in 2017, and we interview pastors and teachers from all over different churches, different denominations, talking about theology. So that's, that's awesome. Awesome. And you guys would consider yourself a theology channel, theology podcast. Is that right? Yeah, so the channel covers uh, history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. So, I mean, if you go back to the early days, it was literally, I was just trying to, I was bored, and I wanted to talk to people about the faith and theology and stuff like that. Um, as the channel's grown over the years, we, we've created really some legs and vision and mission of what we want to do. Uh, we've seen a lot of great fruit from that. That's awesome. And so, and you guys are all charismatic, is that right? You believe in the gifts, the charismata? Mm -hmm. practice okay. them in super ghosty as well as believing yeah <laughs> and you guys speak in tongues man this is awesome yeah, we, got some, talkers. we got some although uh, none, although some none more than michael manifesting Miller. in the chat right now so it's all good we're gonna, yeah. get them, we're gonna get them full of the holy ghost tonight yeah well glad to have you on michael miller what about you what is your background uh jewish mother mormon father so very confusing uh, oh. i became a christian when i was 15 somebody gave me a bible uh I was so terrified of my family finding out that I owned a Bible that I used to hide it in my desk and I'd wait for everybody to go to bed and then I'd start reading it. And I thought, I honestly, this is, I was green. We were non-practicing really. I would go to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur services with my grandparents and that was about it. Um, but I would, uh, I thought it was a book of ancient spells. And so I was like, oh, cool. Like th this is like some <laughs> mystical stuff. And uh, it was one of those Bibles that just had the Psalms, the Proverbs and the New Testament. So I'd memorize some of the Psalms because I thought girls would find it attractive. And then uh, I would read the Gospel of Matthew. I'm not exaggerating. This is true. <laughs> it, is, it is entirely true. Um, but that was the beginning of my walk with Christ. Uh, you know, I, I would pray almost every day to give my life to Jesus because uh, I didn't know. Like, I thought you just had to keep praying it every day, but that's how it worked. Um, but it was 
I loved it. And I uh, loved the miracles and I wanted to go to church. I wanted to find out more about those things. And um, I actually had to go to church to find out God wasn't doing those things. Uh, a narrative which I wouldn't question until my early 20s when I was 22 years old. Uh, I was doing Young Life, uh, pretty much discipled in that organization. And then uh, uh, started questioning whether miracles were happening today. Had an experience with the Holy Spirit soon after praying and asking God to experience His power. And, um, and then was looking for a mentor and read Jack Deere's book, Surprised by the Power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Prayed that God would let me be discipled by someone like Jack Deere, because I thought, man, this guy is smart. He's a seminary professor. He speaks my language, and yet he has real stories of real miracles. And so next thing you know, I'm actually being discipled by the guy. I thought he lived in Montana, and I was in Dallas, Texas. And turns out he was pastoring a, a church 45 minutes from where I lived. And so next thing I know, I'm traveling with him, uh, demonstrating the gifts, learning about the gifts, hanging out with Michael Roundtree, and his story is very similar in that sense. That's and awesome. then I've um, uh, been a part of about four church plants and currently pastoring a church in Denver, Colorado called the Reclamation Church, and uh, and then hanging out with two of my best friends talking theology. So That's I, awesome. And you guys all that. pastor churches? Yeah. Or you guys are all pastors at, uh, at churches? All of us are pastors. We're okay. all pastors. That Praise is very, the Lord. That is... You're doing your time. You're serving your time, brother. God will one day, who knows what will happen. <laughs> That's awesome. And you guys want to just shout at your church really quick for those in the chat that are going to say, what church do you go to? Are you in my area? Uh, maybe where you're at and what your church name is. Unless you you don't want everyone online to know. No, Some people are I secretive we'll about just, it. We won't. No, it, we won't mention it. We don't want to plug yeah. it. We'll, we'll just let it. Go to their channel. You can best. find their church. It's probably best. Uh, we, we've got all of our information on the website. So if people want to go to renderradio.com, they can find out all about our churches and, and all that good stuff. So that'd be you a, a great a place to might have a huge crowd on Sunday of people saying, I saw you on the podcast. I researched hey, your church. We, if you live in Ada, Oklahoma, I'm sure you've got a massive audience in Ada, Oklahoma, Isaiah. Uh, How but many maybe people, in this five, town of five thousand or ten thousand. Uh, I've got I've got thirty thousand in oh, the kind okay. of area. So place. yeah, so yeah, it's it's not it's not nothing, but it's you have to drive an, an hour to get to another town. So hey, uh, you should ask you should ask Roundtree his story. He was my boss for about I don't know how many years, Michael. How many uh, years was that? I, really? I actually, I know like the employment arrangement changed. Miller, but I still consider myself your boss. Hey, <laughs> and Josh, are you actually, their boss or are you guys actually, all co? You know what? That's not true. He married Sarah and ever since then, she's been his boss. Hey. <laughs> I'm joking. You know, uh, hey, well, when you marry up like that, you know, that's the way Good it works. Discovery you know there. We, we do have, we do have equal say as far as Remnant goes. We kind of, we, we function as a team. Uh, I am a full-time staff member with Remnant. So my, my role is a little bit different and and the guys often as i mean since i started remnant we'll get into situations where i mean 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's like we're in i don't know that we've ever been in strong disagreement ever so even i'm saying 99.9 .9 percent of the time i don't think it's ever happened maybe but, tonight uh, when we talk yeah. about delivery maybe we'll see knows? what happens uh they, there has been times where like hey we don't really care we'll just defer to josh because it he's gonna have to live with this decision in a way that the rest of us won't so that makes sense. uh that has happened yeah that makes sense Roundtree, I'd love to hear you. I'll call you guys by your last name since there's two Michaels, but I'd love to hear Perfect. kind of your story and how you ended up uh, doing what you're doing now. Sure. I uh, didn't grow up going to church. Uh, drinking buddy invited me to church when I was 17 years old. Went hoping I may maybe meet a cute girl. There were only about 30 people in the youth group. It was a Pentecostal church. I didn't know what that was. Uh, we met in like a small little classroom, but no, it was Pentecostal, so they were going to have a full band. It was like a third of the youth group was the band. Uh, Holy Spirit showed up. I had no idea what to expect. I won't say whether I met a cute girl that day, but I definitely <laughs> did meet the Lord. Holy Spirit came upon me in power. I had no grid for it whatsoever. I told myself, this is so much better than everything else I've been living for. I'm going to live for Jesus for the rest of my life. Uh, got saved that night at 17, radically changed everything, had been living the party and lifestyle, started going hard after Jesus. My parents thought I was crazy. My family thought I was crazy. My friends uh, also, and, uh, and continued that through my high school years, got into college. So that was a Pentecostal church. It was a great church in a lot of ways, but like on the charismatic side, so like introduced me to that stuff, but there was also some like crazy stuff that I would consider unbiblical at the same time. So it was kind of a mix. 
And, um, and it took me a little while to realize that because I had never read the Bible. And so as mm. I started reading the Bible, I was like, oh, that, that's actually not in there or that part tells you not to do that. But <laughs> anyway, so good church with some excess in the charismatic side. And I uh, put on the seatbelt, the charismatic seatbelt. When I went to college, went to a Baptist church, learned theology, uh, learned discipleship, learned just church fellowship, a lot of really valuable lessons in those days. And uh, it was basically like a Reformed Baptist church, uh, but didn't believe in the gifts. So a pendulum swung from one side to the other. And I was kind of content to live in that world for the rest of my life. And then, uh, and then I met my wife-to-be. Uh, Her name's Alicia. I met her in Scotland on a study abroad trip. We've been married for uh, 20 years uh, and a few months. That's awesome. And we have four kids, Anna, Hudson, Will, and Molly. And, um, and so... And so I met her, fell in love. After we fell in love, she told me, I have a secret. Uh, and you know, she like really built it up. I'm like, what's going on? Do you, you have like some secret habit I don't know about? Well, kind of. No jokes, she, Josh. She tongues. Yeah. <laughs> Josh <laughs> yeah. is struggling. <laughs> yeah. So she spoke in tongues. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, and so, you're one of those. Uh, yeah, you're one of those. So. I was like, but I love you and you're not crazy. So I, I kind of like, you know, remembering my roots and kind of, uh, what do I do with that? Same as Miller, read Jack Deere's books um, about the Holy Spirit, but Jack was this theologian and he really brought together word and spirit. And I said, just like Miller, I said, Lord, would you let me be mentored by Jack Deere someday? Um, fast forward, I moved to the Dallas Fort Worth area. Jack Deere had started a church at the exact same time, started going there. Jack started mentoring me, hired me at his church uh, called Wellspring Church, and I pastored there for 17 years, uh, and then moved to Bridgeway Church, OKC. And uh, and so I've been a pastor most of, of my adult life and joined Remnant Radio in 2020 and doing that too, and uh, we have a blast. So there's, awesome. there's my story in a nutshell. That's it's awesome. It's crazy because we all started at different times. We all came from different backgrounds, but like, it feels like at sometimes we share the same brain. Like it's a it's a weird thing. Michael's works better than me and Miller's. We have dial up or something. We keep, we're accessing the same brain, but just slower. Uh, <laughs> oh no, Rountree is so quick on the ball with scripture. So, his recall his is insane. ridiculous. It's, we just it's pass it to him when we need to know where is it in the Bible. We go round That's tree, right. and then he pulls it up. <laughs> I love that. I was we, thinking earlier today, yeah. the brotherhood you guys have is amazing. It's super rare. I'm grateful I have two or three guys kind of like you guys are, have this brotherhood. We do podcasting together, live streaming together. It's super, super rare. It's rare, and so you guys are blessed to have this brotherhood. I love watching your guys' show. For those that are listening right now, they have an awesome show. I would check it out. I actually met them because they did a show about me, and I'm like, who are these guys? We, we criticized you. They, yes, they <laughs> criticized me, and I'm like, oh, I mean, in a nice way. We were nice. No, hey. Yeah, it was yeah. nice. No, honestly, I was just, I kind of wrote you guys off. I'm like, another channel that's criticizing me. Well, well get in line. You know, it's kind of what I say. Just get, get in line. There's a long line. But then when I listen to your guys' criticisms, I really was like, these are the first guys I've watched on YouTube that have critique over uh, some parts of my ministry, but they're doing it respectfully and honorably. And then we connected, I got on the show, you guys asked me about all the critiques you gave and we kind of got on the same page and agreed to disagree on certain things. And here we are, and then I've been on the show, I think twice total. And so I think it's healthy to do that, you know, healthy critique. And you guys do critique people, but it's in a healthy way. There's a whole world of what I would call heresy hunters, and they don't do it in a healthy way. They do it in an ungodly way. I don't look at your guys' channel as that. I think you guys bring healthy critique and, uh, you know, bring issues up that are important to talk about. And so tonight, we're going to talk about that one of those issues, and that is the ministry of deliverance. And I'm totally cool with the pushback. We can go back and forth. I've listened to you guys, so I know, I don't want to spark anything, but I know you guys aren't all 1,000% in agreement on everything when it comes to deliverance. I've heard you say, I don't agree with you on that, I don't agree with you on that, and I don't think we all going to land on the exact same place when it comes to deliverance. But there are two foundations I do want to discuss, which are in the title, so no clickbait here. The first one is, you know, the early church, deliverance in the early church, and then Christian demonization. So I want to definitely cover both of those. But first I would ask, well, how did you guys even get started with deliverance? And for all those watching live and on the replay, when we talk about deliverance, we are specifically talking about the casting out of demons. Some call it exorcism. That's fine. We call it deliverance. So when you look in your Bible and say, well, deliverance means God bringing them out of Egypt, not casting out demons. We're specifically talking about casting demons out of people. Believers casting demons out of other people. So as we talk tonight about deliverance, that's the word we're using. I know you could say, well, that's exorcism. 
We're just going to use the word deliverance tonight. But I'm interested in how you guys kind of got involved and have you always been involved in deliverance ministry, for lack of a better term? I mean, personally, uh, I started kind of going, I mean, I worked for a guy who was, I was his youth pastor for a while. He decided to do evangelism for three years, and I, I kind of traveled around with him doing that. And I mean, you know what it's like. I, I think there's probably uh, maybe a spiritual gift of deliverance or a special anointing. I mean, I don't know how people want to talk about it, but he walked in a kind of supernatural grace. I think all Christians have authority over demons. I really do. Um, but he seemed, he'd walk into a room and, and people would not know him and he would, man, they would manifest like they did not like being around this guy. Um, so I probably cut my teeth just kind of traveling around someone else who was supernaturally graced in the area. Um, yeah. Okay. So no one had to convince you. You just saw it through his ministry. Well, I mean, I was a Christian. I didn't believe all the demons died at the crucifixion, right? Preach. Like, so I knew they were there. There was really a question of whether in my mind for a long time, if you watch early videos, I was. I was convinced, maybe a strong word. I was, I was very, I argued from the position that Christians couldn't be demonized. Um, but it wasn't from a experienced thing. It was just like a, I, I grew up in my culture. My culture said that I saw people who were demonized and often people who profess Jesus who were demonized, but they were also playing with a lot of sin. And my definition of a Christian at the time was, well, you, you just backslid and you lost your salvation, that kind of thing. That was just, okay. that was easy to go there. Um, I don't hold that position anymore. I don't think salvation is like a pair of car keys that you misplace. Um, I think I just have a, a better grasp of what the gospel is in Christ's work in our life. So um, I'm in a different place now through the careful guidance of Michael Miller and Michael Roundtree. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely in the position that, yes, there are real demons today. There is a real ministry for Christians to deliver people who are demonized. And everyone that I know who's ever done that has done that with Christians. Um, it's good. What about you, Miller? Yeah. How'd you get involved in deliverance? Uh, well, remember that power encounter I mentioned I had? Well, in that power encounter, on top of just being overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, I also started dry heaving and was delivered. Okay. And so in it's the same way when you... One fell, yeah. Uh, I never... I, that was never a debate for me, uh, but I hadn't really been taught against the idea that Christians couldn't have a demon. I'd always just sort of, it was sort of a blank slate as far as I was concerned. And so I just came to it naturally. Uh, although I would say, um, it wasn't long after just praying for the sick that I started seeing it happen, um, down in South Africa, praying for a woman who feels confused. And the next thing I know, I've got this demon telling me, I don't like you. And so I was like, I don't like you either. Let's do this. And so I uh, ended up getting this woman delivered. And that was the first time I had one actually chat with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just did a deliverance weekend uh, out in, in New Jersey uh, with one of our Convergence Network churches. And dude, I, I mean, bar the door, man. It was crazy. Uh, kicked out so many demons. It was just, it was a messy, beautiful thing in the sense that it's so crazy and messy, but when you see these people's lives change because suddenly the anger that they used to live with, the mm. rage they used to display to their kids, they're not displaying anymore. Um, so I, I mean, I love deliverance ministry. I will fight tooth and nail to protect those who are also doing it uh, so long as they're righteous and good men because uh, it, there's far too many, far too few Christians actually doing the work. Yes, so. absolutely. And I think at the end of the day, the core is it's Jesus's ministry. So even the word deliverance ministry, of course, we all use it and it's fine. But biblically, it was like, this is the ministry of Christ. And to me, I just look at so plainly at scripture and, and realize if I'm Christ's ambassador, Paul says we're ambassadors of Christ and I'm representing him and he healed the sick and cast out demons and then says we should do the same works. We don't even have to argue about greater. We'll just stick with the same works. It seems so easy to realize that I'm called as a Christian to do the work of Christ on the earth. And that work involves casting out demons, whether those listening like it or not. If you are a Christian, you're called to represent Christ. And one of the things Christ did everywhere he went literally was he cast out demons. We live in a society, I think that so needs and so desperate for the delivering power of God. I love salvation. I love what God does in people's lives. I love people that get born again and seeing the flesh get crucified, but there's a special work of deliverance that Christ does in someone's life that I don't think you can replace with just crucify your flesh. And I think the modern church has been told for so many years, just crucify your flesh, just crucify your flesh. And we've lost the component of, we actually can drive the demon out of you in the name of Jesus. 
And there's something that happens when you come in his power and his authority that is so life-changing that people say, I've crucified my flesh for years and I've tried and tried and tried, but there's this voice telling me, take my life. There's this voice telling me to look at this pornography. There's, there's a desire in me. So we don't want to blame things on demons. Of course not. But there is a component of if there's an unclean spirit there, deliverance is the antidote according to scripture. If it's just your flesh, then you need to crucify your flesh. But you guys have heard it said, you can't cast out the flesh and you can't crucify a demon. So I think there's definitely a room, there's definitely room for this ministry and it's massively needed. People go like, when are you gonna stop talking about it? I always say, when everyone starts talking about it, I'll stop talking about it. I would love this to become normal in the American church because it was normal in the gospels. All right, there's my sermon. Roundtree, how did you get uh, involved in deliverance ministry? Sure. Um, I would say, well, first of all, by getting them cast out of me, and um, hey. I was kind of going through some tough things in my life and uh, had this woman who was kind of, she was like my counselor, but then she kind of became a spiritual mama. She got into deliverance ministry and she's like, I think you'd really benefit from this. And so she and her ministry partner uh, led me through some deliverance ministry. And honestly, I learned some things both to do and not to do. I, I, I've don't do it precisely the same way. I, I did learn that, you know what, I think we get so obsessed with like a method that we think it's if good. you just do this thing, it's going to work. And I, I think they did some things that weren't that great, but God still delivered me because mm. he's not looking for perfect methods. He's looking for just people who align their hearts with the kingdom of God. And that's what was taking place. And so uh, I remember just from that, I didn't do the dry heaving, but I did yawning. I yawned for yeah. two straight hours. Wow. And uh, I'm, I'm like driving to my next appointment. I'm like, <laughs> people driving next to me like, what, what is that guy listening to on the radio? <laughs> like, Anyway, so that, that was part of it. And then also, as Miller and I were being mentored by Jack Deere, there was a woman in our church who had dissociative identity disorder and like a host of other kind of crazy things. We were completely not equipped to deal with severe mental disorder. But Jack just taught us to listen to the Holy Spirit. And we just like, we would come with no agenda. We just talk, listen to her, listen to the Holy Spirit, and just kind of see where it led. And uh, we did this over the course of several weeks and several hours each time. And it just taught me kind of how to go deep and to find those satanic Good. footholds in somebody's life. And she ended up being completely set free, testified about it in our church. So that was the, just those two events were the beginning of it, uh, of it for me. That's so good. And I like how you talk about going deep because it seems to be there's a very drive-by deliverance style in America where it's like, yeah, I went through deliverance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, how did you get prayer? Well, they prayed for me for like 30 seconds at an altar. And that's great. And God can deliver people during the sermon at an altar in 30 seconds. God can do all, all those things. But it seems that like when you start really diving in deep in deliverance, sometimes it does take time. And sometimes you do got to dig and go deeper and the demons are stubborn. And I love the idea that, oh, just command it to leave one time and it goes instantly. Yet anybody who actually practices deliverance doesn't teach that because you know there is a wrestling match sometimes that takes place in deliverance. Sometimes there's interroga interrogation, not conversation, interrogation. Sometimes the demons are stubborn. Sometimes, you know, we got to fight and battle and there's no, I would say, specific strategy. But like in any war, there's a specific strategy for each battle. And so I would say for each person, there could be a general rule of thumb. But I always look at deliverance as a puzzle and every person, there's a different puzzle and a different thing that has to happen. And, and God leads that and the Holy Spirit leads that. But I, I really am, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of disheartened by a lot of the drive-by deliverance ministries that we're seeing where it's a quick instant, you fall over and it's like, we declare them delivered. And in my mind, I think there's a lot of people that are getting declared delivered at, you know, on a video in five seconds that aren't actually delivered. So I think there is, like you said, there's more of a deeper process sometimes, not always, but sometimes we got to go deeper with people and, and really wrestle. Um, do you guys have any I, thoughts on like the quickness of deliverance? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to stab, like take a stab at that, like kind of that story real quick. We moved to Ada, Oklahoma, which is uh, kind of native American country. Right. And uh, when we moved here, my son was having night terrors right after we got here. Right. And he recognized my, my, what he was six at the time. So my six year old, I don't know, he was five at the time could recognize that when dad prayed for me, I don't have night terrors. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. But when he doesn't pray for me, and I pray for him almost every night, but he would notice that if I was out of, like out of town or I was at work late not one night and I come back and I'd pray for him, if I, if I didn't pray for him, he'd have a nightmare. So he's like, hey, dad, don't forget to pray for me. Don't forget to pray for me. He falls asleep. I'm on my computer working at night or whatever. I forget to pray for him. He wakes up at like 2 a.m., tears in his eyes, angry. Dad, you didn't pray. And I realized, yeah. okay, my my five-year-old has more discernment that this is spiritual and I, I don't, I'm not figuring this out. So, wow. you know, we kind of walk through the five-step model. Model. Hey, buddy, how did this start? You know, w- w- when did this start happening? You know, like, did you watch something scary on TV? Was it was it at school? When we dropped you out of school, did something happen? Trying to figure out, like, w- what was the trigger for this kind of thing? And then, uh, you know, my five-year-old super not helpful. And this is, I think, really where you can have a model, like the five-step model. There's nothing wrong with it. But, like, at the end of the day, like, if you aren't led by the Spirit, you're just, yeah. you're shooting in the dark. And so I just asked the Lord, I say, Lord, like, what's, what's going on? And I, I had my memory instantly recalled to when I moved to the house, there was, there was hung up over the, the, the basically over his window. It's very close to his window at the front door, um, was, uh, a, a, a dream catcher mm. like that, that, and I just remembered, oh yeah, there was that dream catcher and I pulled it down and I put it on the ground because we didn't have dumpsters because we had just moved in. We needed to order dumpsters. So I, I put it down. Uh, you know, by his window, and it had been covered with leaves, and I forgot that it was there. I walked out there, kicked the leaves, took the took the icon, took the relic, if you will, tossed it in the garbage. Uh, dumpster came, picked it up. No more night terrors. And it was one wow. of those situations where it was like, okay, my five year old doesn't even have the intellectual capacity to tell me what was the open door, what happened. But like, Lord, you can lead me, That's good. and He can highlight the moment you know, and, and reveal whatever that is. So um, I think that's that's what Michael's talking about, you know, drive by, having models can be helpful when we preach sermons. You know, we tell people, you know, you explain the text, you illustrate the text, you apply the text, right? Like that's generally how you do it. But the longer you've been preaching, the more you kind of fall into a flow of the spirit and you can break those rules more liberally. And, and not, not that it's about breaking rules, but the having a model is good to learn, but then to be led by the spirit is really, I think, the the ultimate aim uh, for anyone doing deliverance. That's so good. I love that. And what are your guys' thoughts on the idea that many have and many watching and those that will listen on the replay? Once you get saved, you don't need deliverance after that. All the demons instantly leave you. I, I see a lot of people talking about that. Like, you just need to get saved. You just need to get saved. If you get saved, then all the demons instantly go. Do you guys have any thoughts on that specific thing? Uh, this is funny because this is actually a conversation that Josh and I had early on. We used to debate this topic. Josh didn't believe that Christians could have demons. I did. Now he's on and, the right um, side. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the questions I asked him, I said, well, what's the point of deliverance? Just get everybody saved. Yeah. Why did Jesus bother casting out demons? And if everybody, all you have to do is get them saved, then, then that would take care of all of it. Yep. But that's not the way he did things. And, and in fact, early history, Christian history shows just the opposite. There's a book written by a... A secular historian. I don't have it on my shelf. Uh, I wish I did. Um, where, oh, no, I do. Right here. This book right here. Secular historian, uh, the Christianization of the Roman Empire, says that the reason why the Roman Empire was one to Christ, this is not a believer who says this, was because Christians would cast out demons. Wow. That's what he says. He said, i got to be honest with the history. This is what we have a record of. And so... Um, Anyway, but as far as Christians having demons, um, yeah, that, that idea, it's, I, I get it. It makes things nice and neat for people because I think the problem is we overinflate the power of the enemy. We fail to recognize our authority and that we win. Yeah. Um, John, uh, Roundtree probably has a lot more scripture you could add to it, though. Oh, well, I was actually going to quote, there's a deliverance minister named Neil Lozano, and he says, uh, he says, deliverance is as much about the devil as the Exodus was about Pharaoh. Mm. And we tend to make it so much, it's the devil, 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 devil. But when you think about the Exodus, it's really not about Pharaoh. It's actually about God's care for his people. That's good. And so deliverance ministry is God caring for his people. And um, so, yeah, there are a lot of scripture references for that, but... Uh, we, I, I, I'm trying to remember actually what question we started with on this. We just he was just oh, saying, the, can Christians be demonized? Our our overarching. Well, well theme, I was saying like when people say we don't we don't yeah. need deliverance because oh, once people get saved, the demons automatically leave, and so it kind of negates the idea that we need a deliverance hap- to happen ever because we just get people saved, and then automatically when you get saved at salvation, 
all the demons instantly leave you. Now we know there's nowhere in the Bible that says that, but I just wanted you guys' thoughts on that idea because yeah. a lot of yeah, people are, think, don't do deliverance because of that. Yeah, I think what I would want people to recognize is there's a difference between a theological argument and an exegetical argument where an exegetical argument is like the text says this, therefore that's my conclusion. Theological argument, a theological argument is fine, but we have to be careful with them because they can get like a few steps removed from the text. So in this case, the theological argument being um, once you're a Christian, all the demons go. There's not a, to your point, Isaiah, there is not an exegetical argument. There's not a text that says that. You're just reasoning, well, God is holy mm. and the Holy Spirit comes into you and demons can't live in the same temple. Well, maybe that's true, maybe that's false, but there's no text that says that. But what I would say, if I was to try to come with an exegetical argument, uh, actually pushing against this, I would say, well, Romans chapter 7 says, I know that sin dwells in me, that is in my sinful nature. So within the temple that is my body, I can have sin, like the very opposite of God yes. can live in me at the same time that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And so if that can be true of sin, certainly that could be true of sinful beings. I mean, a, a spirit. So um, I, I think that it's, we, we just, it, it, the truth is there's not a perfect exegetical argument for either side, but I don't That's think good. the theological arguments work for their side. And, and I think we can make some better theological arguments for our side. And I think, I think it comes down to just semantics and language. A lot of the arguments on the other side are, we can't be possessed, we can't be possessed, we can't be possessed. Yes. And they're happy with language of oppress, right? Like, oh, your son wasn't possessed. He was being oppressed. He had nightmares. And it's like, yeah, but you're, you're splitting hairs in a way that the Bible doesn't. The, the verb of being demonized, it's, a, it's a, a noun turned into a verb. In Greek, uh, the, the Bible uses language of demonization. It's just any kind of demon activity. It's a noun yeah. turned into a verb. And um, anyway, is it, is it de demonizomai or something like that? Miller, you've got the actual m word memorized. Demonizomai. So it's demon, yeah. and they add the edzomai to it, which is no different than we would do in English. Demon eyes. Right. So it, it, to, to say that, okay, you can't be possessed, possessed, possessed. Well, if the language is just demonized, which just means any demon activity, then actually all Christians agree then that there can be demonic activity. Um, it just, the language of oppressed and possessed is language that we're, we're debating over, but we're actually thrusting our language onto the text of scripture. And it doesn't, it's, it's not, it's not deciding that for us. Um, we're, we're debating something the Bible's not. Yeah, I try to remove when teaching on deliverance or talking about deliverance, I try to remove the word oppressed and possessed out of people's vocabulary because the idea most people have watching right now are if I'm oppressed by a demon, the demon's on me. It's kind of like clawing on my shoulders, maybe getting a piggyback ride from me. Maybe two or three demons are all getting a piggyback ride. But if I'm possessed... The demon's inside of me controlling me. I'm like a robot and the demon controls me. So everyone in the chat would say, I'm a Christian. A demon could never be in me controlling me. So we have these oppressed or possessed. If I post something right now on Instagram, uh, Christians can have demons. 99.9% .9 of the comments are going to come and say, Christians can't be possessed. Christians, I didn't say possessed. I said Christian can have a demon. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to, like you said, the daimonizomai, the original text, is to be under the power of a demon. That is to be demonized. In the Greek, there was no distinguishing factor between oppressed or possessed. Like, we don't see Jesus in the gospel saying, that guy's oppressed and that guy's possessed. There's no distinguishing in the Bible. So I just feel, if Jesus never distinguished between possessed or oppressed, we shouldn't. All it does to me is confuse people. It adds another layer of, of complexity that we don't need. So I just say, hey, you're demonized. If there's a demon there, I don't care if it's on your toe. I don't care if it's up your nose. I don't care if it's in you, on you, around you, in your swimming pool. If there's a demon there and you're under the power of that demon, let's do what Jesus did. I mean, it's so much better than what your professor of Bible college does and talk us out of it. Let's cast it out of you. Let's not counsel it. Let's not give it pills. If it is a demon, now that's assuming it's a demon. Let's cast the demon out of you. And to me, when we start going oppressed and possessed, I'm fine with the language. I just personally don't use it because I feel like it adds a level of complexity. We just don't need. Let's just get the demon out. Well, I'm a Christian. I can't have a demon. Well, you do. So you're the one telling me you do. You're the one telling me you're hearing voices. You're the one telling me you're dealing with this addiction. You can't break. You've done everything. You've prayed. You fasted. You've cried out to God. So 
I'm not going to put you on the stand. When you come to me and say, I think I have a demon, I don't put your salvation at question. Let's attack the demon, not your salvation. Because most people will go to their pastor and say, hey, Pastor Joshua, I have, I think I have a demon. And the pastor that doesn't believe a Christian could have a demon, now I have to put your salvation in question. I have to say, you're not saved because a Christian can't have a demon. And if you have a demon, you must not be saved. And I just think that's damaging to someone. Why are we attacking someone's salvation? Why don't we attack the demon? Like, I don't want to debate you whether you're saved or not. Let's just cast the demon out of you. And then I'll turn it over to you guys in a moment. My last thought would be on this is how can you tell somebody they can't have something? If you're a Christian and you go play the Ouija board, I still think you're a Christian. You're a bad Christian, but I still think you're a Christian. I just think you're opening up a door. And if you open a door, God's not going to protect you in disobedience. So I just think if you play Ouija board and you're a Christian, you open yourself up to a demon and a demon can come in. You're still a Christian, but now you're a Christian with a demon. But guess what? I'm a Christian that does deliverance. So let's cast the demon out of you. Let's not cast salvation out of you. So that's kind of my thoughts. I don't know if you guys want to add on to that. Um, I've got a story in that vein. I won't use any names because uh, this guy's built a good, I think a decent relationship with us. Um, he actually, I, I built a relationship with the, oddly kind of how you built a relationship with us. Like someone made a critique video of Remnant. So <laughs> I'm like, I was uh, you know, engaging with this guy. He was a little bit more strongly worded than, than we were of you. He was like, these Remnant guys need to repent. You know, it's a false gospel stuff. Like, you know, I'm really contending with you brothers, please repent. And I reached out to him on Facebook and said, Hey man, um, thanks for, you know, your video. Thank you for being, being like willing to reach out and want to talk. Like you not just like try to bride bash, but like you were, you were trying to engage with us. You really wanted to talk. I'm just going to open up that line of communication. And then he was just like, well, you know, you, you've done this with these, these guys, you're clearly endorsing this movement. And I just responded, these are the things I've publicly said. And I just walked through a list of like seven things, eight things that I've publicly said about the issues he was concerned with. Uh, and he was just like super repentant. And I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. I had no clue. I just assumed because you were in some of this space that you must be endorsing of all these different things. And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm super sorry. You know, I apologize. And, and just uh, he pulled the video, great relationship, talking back and forth with me. In fact, we talk back and forth frequently now. And and recently, he was in a position where he's like, hey, man, I don't really believe Christians can be demonized. He goes, but I have a problem. Like, I'm reformed. I believe Christians can't lose their salvation. Miller's laughing because he knows about this story. And he's like, my buddy in California, I am convinced. I have seen the fruit of the Holy Spirit in his life. I know he is saved. And he's like... And he's hearing voices. He's like, he backslid one time into drugs. And he's like, he's reaching out to his like Pentecostal friends that 10 seconds ago, he didn't think we're, he didn't even think we're saved. Yeah, but like now he's called, like, though. dude, deliver my friend from demons because you have experience with this. I'm convinced you're a brother now, which by the way, like this is such a good like learning lesson for people who are watching. Like don't snipe at people. Like encourage conversation, have a conversation. If you're critical of someone, talk to them because it's like, I was not angry at this guy. I reached out to him for each, just like Isaiah reached out to us. Like we, we built a relationship and we're able to like, like strive for unity and the bond of peace. And it actually ended up, I think probably getting his friend delivered, right? Like mm. Miller, did you, did you, have you, I haven't. Yeah, you, you always hand me the cases. I, uh, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Well, yeah. Roundtree, give us the verses. I, Miller, casually. cast out the demons. Yeah, yeah, that's Josh, right. That's make right. A thumbnail. Uh, I'll have a story. I, I'll I make hope a thumbnail. So. I actually, that it reminded out. me to message him and schedule an appointment because we haven't scheduled the time yet, but that's also because I've been is, traveling. It's like the, guy was, the guy was in California. It, there was some distance removed. Anyway, so there, there was a couple of situations that, that prevented us from stabbing it um, like in the moment. But You're in California, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in California. I'm in Central California, so the Central Valley. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know where you. he's at, but if he's in the area, a reformed guy, I was like, hey, I just want to let you know, this is how we do it. I'm going to walk through this process of repent, well, pronounce, actually, repent, <laughs> expel. Yeah, people, people don't believe yeah, Christians, could have, people don't believe <laughs> Christians could have demons until they have one. Then they're like, actually, I believe it. I had a friend tell another friend of mine who's a pastor, Isaiah's crazy. He believes Christians could have demons. They're having dinner at his house. And he's like, oh, yeah, I believe Christians could have demons. He's like, what? And they're going back and forth. And then 30 minutes go by and he says, hey, bro, can you pray for me? I'm having this issue. They go to the back room. And the guy who 30 minutes ago was saying, I, Isaiah's a heretic because he believes Christians could have demons was <laughs> screaming in the back room. Ah! what are you and got fully delivered and then told, cast out yes got, <laughs> full, got fully over. delivered and told my friend dude i'm so sorry isaiah was right i had a demon and this was a pastors with pastors right so yeah it's like uh everybody doesn't believe it until the demon comes knocking on your door and you're like oh maybe i do have a critter on board
So that's a definitely that's right. true story. <laughs> I, I want to hear your Love thoughts. Uh, maybe we'll pass it to Miller and Roundtree. Obviously, we're going to have to for sure do it an episode two or a part two at some point because I'm looking at the time and I'm like, we're barely getting warmed up here and we're 40 minutes in. And I know you guys all have things you got to do tonight and you're hours ahead of me. The idea that after the book of Acts, we all have heard, I won't say who says this all the time because they're probably in the chat, but a certain community always says, after the book <laughs> of Acts, deliverance never happened. It's not in the early church. It's not in the epistles. Paul never taught anyone. It's done. We don't need it. Um, give us a little bit of fact on deliverance after the book of acts and maybe any evidence you guys might have i know you guys have actually what i'm going to do is this for the sake of time i'm going to link two episodes that you guys did like over two hours of content on deliverance in the early church i'll post that in the description after this video so you guys can get it full in depth but maybe give us just a little summary from you guys on deliverance in the early church and maybe some research you guys have done on it okay so Miller this looks book right ready. here yeah, well, the fact is, I didn't do the research. This guy did it for me and made it super easy. And I'm just like, so thankful somebody finally did it. But it's called Demon Possession and the Believer in the Early Church by Timothy Camps. So it reads like a dissertation, just fair warning. Um, it's just it's just thick, right? Like he he goes through and just does a, a full boring statistical if you've never analysis. Read a dissertation, yeah. it means boring. <laughs> but, but one of the things I love is he quotes Tertullian. Now, I mean, think of this. This guy helped us. He's the first one. I think Tertullian was the one who coined the phrase Trinity, right, to describe the Godhead. And so this guy helped us with our Trinitarian theology. Like we, we know <laughs> we, we, our, our creeds are littered with his influence. Um, and he says this about a young woman who he had already cast a demon out of who was a believer who she gets demonized again. And when he's interrogating this demon, he says, you know, what gives you the audacity to afflict this woman? And the demon just responds. He says, she was in my domain. Mm. Real plain and simple. So a Christian, a believer, and she's been re-demonized. She picked, up, she picked back up her old hitchhiker, and it was because she would go to the Roman theater where all kinds of egregious sin would take place. And it was a place of idolatry. And we're told flat out in, in 1 Corinthians 10, you know, uh, hey, don't you know the things that the Gentiles sac sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons mm. and not to God. And I do not want you to be partakers of demons or sharers of demons. And that word sharer or partaker is the same word uh, that we use for fellowship. It's klinonia. It's good. It's like the, the implication is, is when you go to these festivals and you partake of the sacrifices that are sacrificed to these gods, you're partaking of the demonic entity. Um, and so anyway, uh, this book has tons of references, uh, Tertullian just being one of many. Um, and yeah, it also shows that it, it's not just the early church, but you see this through both Antonicea, post Nicaea on up until the enlightenment. And it's after the enlightenment and the French enlightenment that we start to see the idea that Christians can't have demons. That's, that's when it first comes into, into play. But prior to that, it was never even a debate. It's good. Yeah. Uh, so come back to the question of like, Hey, you had deliverance uh, in the gospels and you had it in acts, but you don't see it after that. I think is a misunderstanding of just when we look at narrative literature and what's being communicated there versus epistles. Uh, epistles are addressing specific questions. So Paul will say, like, now concerning food sacrifice to idols, now concerning spiritual gifts, now concerning the Lord's Supper. And so they have questions and certain things that come up. And so uh, they're the purpose of the epistles is to address very specific questions. Good. And so the, but the purpose of narrative literature uh, it is different. It's not strictly tied to that specific local church situation. And, uh, and there are probably things that I can't think of right now, like everybody agrees, even though it stopped in the book of Acts, Josh Miller, maybe y'all can help me out. Things that like, don't reappear in the epistles, but we all just the readily word disciple. Accept. The word disciple doesn't appear in any yeah. epistles. Nowhere does it say uh, to make disciples. Communion. Yeah. yeah. The word, the word pastor. Mission. Are we to not pastor. keep the great commission? Yeah. Even the, uh, just because we only see it in the gospels and in well, no, that's silly. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I would say is like main purpose in Acts. It begins with like the first verse. It says. Uh, you know, like I'm writing this book to you, O Theophilus, about 
uh, about Jesus began to do and teach before he ascended. Just think about like how crazy that is. Like usually when they're a religious leader, the end of their life is the end of their ministry. But for Jesus, the end of his life was the beginning of his wow, ministry. He was just getting started. So that's what he's saying. And he uses the language of to do and to teach, which in Luke, you see the same thing. In Luke 24, he was a prophet, mighty word and deed. Those go together because it's Jesus' ongoing, uh, ongoing ministry. He's teaching, doing miraculous works, and he's continuing. But how is he doing it? Acts chapter 1, it continues uh, that, that Jesus is going to pour his Holy Spirit out on the church. When? When he sends to the right hand of God. Mm. So if the Gospels are Jesus' earthly ministry... Uh, the book of Acts is Jesus's heavenly ministry exhibited through his spirit empowered church. So as long as the That'll church preach. has spirit, we should expect that Jesus continue to do this ministry and he'll continue till he returns. The book of Acts is making a theological argument. And the argument is this, this is at the right hand of God. He is doing all the things that he once did, Come on. but now he's not doing it through his local body in Jerusalem or wherever he was. Now he's doing it through his spirit-empowered body, his church on the earth. That's the argument that it's making. And Luke says, uh, the, and the other argument that it makes is he says this will continue until Jesus comes back. And, uh, and so you can kind of see that in the flow of Acts chapter 1 power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. And it goes right on from there in verses nine through 11 to talk about the ascension. He's coming back just like he returned. So in his ascension, he's now seated at the right hand of God. We call that in theology, the session of Christ mm -hmm. reigning through a spirit empowered church that continues to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. That's actually Jesus doing those things. It's why, uh, it's why Peter says in Acts chapter three, and then uh, you know, Jesus Christ heals you. Jesus is the one actually doing the work. Jesus is the one kicking out demons. And so what I would want to put back to uh, the cessationist, the one who says these things ceased after the book of Acts, I would just say, does Jesus still sit at the right hand of God? And when they say, well, okay, he sits at the right hand of God. And I say, that's right. He still reigns over the devil and he reigns through a spirit empowered church. That's good. so good. Hey, Isaiah, if you want me to, I can run through some of the church yeah. fathers. I wouldn't yeah, even I would quote love to. their quotations. Yeah, I would love yeah, to so, just to run through some. Yeah, so we, we we walked through this on the show. We encourage you to go check out that link that Isaiah is going to put in the description. But Origen, uh, the book Shepherd of Hermas, the Apostolic Tradition, Eusebius, 3rd and 4th century, uh, the Cyril of Jerusalem, this is like 315 to 386, Thomas Aquinas. That's 1225 to 1274. We have the Apostolic Constitutions, which is kind of 4th century. Uh, we've got the Apostolic Canons. Uh, we've got uh, the cl uh, Clement uh, homilies. We've got the uh, recognition of Clement. We've got, um, man, so many early church uh, saints. Paconius. I mean, so many early church guys from different subsequent centuries who are seeing demonic stuff in the church, in Christians being cast out. And we, we go through all of that in our video. Sorry, sorry Miller, what was up? Well, you just went through mostly post Nicaea. If you go back, uh, I think you're looking at the second show notes that we did on this. But you've also got Asterus Urbanus, who lived in 232 AD. He wrote, you've got Hippolytus or Hippolytus Cyprian. Uh, all of these guys, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, they also have quotations on the same content. People, Christians being demonized. He calls them catechumens say, in these texts. So you guys are saying there's overwhelming evidence throughout church history, throughout some of these early church fathers, people we look to for things like More. the Trinity, and overwhelming evidence that not only were, was deliverance happening, people were getting demons cast out of them, but for many of these, these were Christians getting deliverance. And let's go even further, the idea that a Christian can't have a demon wasn't something that was highly debated or contested like it is today. Because today... This is the, man, it's so contentious. I'm so sick of talking about well, it. It's like always Christians can't have demons. Christians can't have demons. But they had words for it. They, they made up words for Christians who had demons. 
So like there was like a word literally had words. a person who'd gone through a catechism and there was a, a word it's intergumens or whatever. It was a Christian who had not yet been baptized because they had not yet been delivered of demons. Like they mm-hmm. had a made up word for Christians who had demons. Like it well, was the, that the practice. Common. The practice was to take them through daily exorcisms until the bishop came down to then also do an exorcism and then baptize them. That wow. became early church practice, standard. Tra- so, th- so it, mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, this would be great for the church today. And I actually have it as part of our bringing on new disciples, new believers uh, into baptism. We plan to do exorcisms with them, going through their That's past good. sins and getting them set free. Um, which we should be doing. It's actually a great practice. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> but that good. was standard. I, I think every Christian should go through it. And people are like, well, what if I don't have anything? Well, that's great. You got free prayer. I mean, the, best, God. the worst thing that can happen is you got prayer. Free and the prayer. best thing that can happen is you got free. So the idea that, oh, I don't need deliverance. I would, I would never need that. I'm like, well, I don't know. I, to me, why not go through it? Why not have someone pray over you? It's not some mystical incantation. It's literally prayer where we're commanding whatever's there to leave you. And if nothing's there, you don't have to be afraid. Maybe, just I'm just saying I might be wrong, there might be something living in you that doesn't want you to go for prayer, that doesn't want you to go for deliverance. When I'm in church and the pastor does an altar call, hey, if you want more of God, come up here. I, I could be wrong. I've only been at this for 13 years. I have never had God tell me, Isaiah, you're good. You don't need more of me. You don't need to go up there. You don't need prayer. You don't need anything. I'm always like, man, I want to go all in. I want to go to the altar. If someone does an altar call saying, who wants more of God? Me, I want more of God. I'm coming up. So to me, this this pride or arrogance that goes, ah, I don't really need that. I don't need deliverance. I don't need prayer. I'm fine where I'm at. I, I just think as the body of Christ, we all as Christians should go through. We're in a real battle. Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. I want to make sure the devil has nothing in me. So I'm going to go through Amen. deliverance prayer. And we're just using, for lack of a better term, to make sure that's, that there's nothing there. But yeah, so you guys are saying, just to recap, it's overwhelming evidence. When do you guys think, I know we don't, all know, we don't know exactly, but when did the idea, that's very popular, we need to break this idea that Christians can't have demons, is there any evidence to where maybe that started or what time period that language started developing? Uh, I I would say that like it seemed like kind of and there were big changes in the Roman Empire kind of uh, you know around the time of Constantine around the time as Christianity was becoming nationalized and it wasn't just with deliverance ministry but it was with like there seemed to be a drop in power generally mm. as it just became the cool thing to be a Christian. And so, you know, before that, it was like the persecuted thing, cool thing. You didn't want to be a Christian. It, 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 I mean, people want to become Christians because there was a stigma associated with it. And, uh, and so as that started to change, uh, and it wasn't even just like it was not just deliverance. It was also kind of all forms of power. Also at that time, you start to shift, bring the radio into communion. Uh, so I've done a lot of research on the church history of it, but uh, I think it was sitting quoted saying something like, oh, I want to take communion, but there's no one around to take it with me. Like mm. people, people you know, like dropped off in doing that. Mm. And so like basic practices of the church, it, it just became worse. And I mean, there was some beauty in it too, because, like, Hey, I mean, Christianity just went all over an empire in an instant so there was some like goodness and beauty to it that god used but it was overall a less powerful christianity and all that i've read in the church fathers like about deliverance i would say like a huge chunk of it was in the first 400 years Mm. and after that you do still read some you just read less just like with the other forms of power too you still see prophecy you still even see tongues you just see less Really yeah, there's, there's a lot of explanations for that. Sam Storms uh, has a book, Understanding Spiritual Gifts, a Comprehensive Guide. We use it in our e-course. We have a, a 13-week e-course, Discipling People in the Gifts of the Spirit. And in, that, uh, in the book, he says the phrase, well, I'm going to paraphrase it. He, he says this idea that 
when the church became kind of institutionalized and ministry became for the professionals and the bishops and it wasn't democratized to all people, it really affected the power because wow. everyone was seeking power. Every, it was like every man a minister. But when you had the bishops, it was like we we're trying to protect people from paganism. When it became Christianity became popular, you had all these pagans coming into the church who were like practicing prophecy. But the prophecy that they were practicing was like, you know, like from a what is the serpent spirit and you know, the Dagon or not the Dagon, what were, the Python Delphi. spirit or whatever yep. that we see in Acts. Like it was by another spirit and they were kind of in the church and the bishops were like, whoa, 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 whoa. Nobody does the gifts except people who are ordained. So it, there became a distinction between the piety and the laity because of the paganism that was coming into the church in droves and they weren't equipping people to, to take care of that. So that affected it. But to Michael's point, it's not to say that there wasn't any of it. You can see the bishops were still walking in power. You know, St. Augustine, was still seeing tremendous healings and miracles like the early church and and beyond and every subsequent generation saw tremendous demonstrations of healing and prophecy and deliverance i think miller has got a theory on the french enlightenment though that i think is really where we begin to see a lot of the shift taking place from they everyone kind of agreed they could be demonized to they do not get demonized like that strong shift there's certainly a power dynamic but the actual language and theology i don't think changed until the enlightenment so I think I think if I was to blame whoever <laughs> I was to blame somebody, I would say the church brought in a lot of enlightenment thinking, right? So we wanted to be able to prove things with a scientific method, uh, and then on top of that, it happens. The French Enlightenment also happens to coincide with Protestant Reformation, right? So you've okay. you've got Calvin who comes up with this doctrine called cessationism, which doesn't exist uh, prior. Like this is what it was. This is where cessationism was birthed out of. It was a way to discredit Catholicism because the Catholics would always point to their miracles and to their saints, and then the 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 reformers would say, ah, we should give no credence to that. But the thing is, even the reformers were split on the topic. You've got the Scottish reformers and much of the uh, Reformation who was like, yeah, gifts are still happening. George Wishart was a well-known prophet in Scotland. Like to this day, his stories of him still abound. Um, and so with Calvin and cessation of the gifts, you also have French enlightenment. And so anything that's re uh, relatively uh, miraculous in nature starts to disappear. And, and David Hume, the philosopher, is probably the worst about all of this. If you read uh, Craig Keener's two-volume work on miracles, he spends like mostly the first volume discussing Hume and Hume's impact on Christendom. And so then bring it over to the West and to the Protestant uh, churches of the West, and you've got guys like Chuck Smith, who is well, um, well established, Calvary Chapel. Uh, he says, you know, uh, yeah, there may be some deliverance that happens, but it mostly happens in places like Africa, not here in the West, mm. where it's mostly Christian. Which, which is silly, because you see Jesus casting demons out left and right. Tell yep. me, tell me, re, tell me that the days of Chuck Smith were less sinful than the days of Jesus. Wow, tell me, tell me, that doesn't make any sense. And so he, he started popularizing this. As a matter of fact, Lonnie Frisbee would cast demons out. Chuck Smith made him go outside. He wouldn't let yeah. him do it in the church. I know that to be true. Yeah, I've had Lonnie Frisbee's yeah. best friend on, and he told me he told me some stories about that. Yeah, not, not yeah, allowing Yeah, Chuck didn't like it. He, he was super un uncomfortable with it. But I would also say that he popularized. He was the one who started teaching things like, well, the, uh, a demon can't reside in the same place as the spirit. Like, mm. You don't find any of this argumentation prior. You, you just don't hear it. So I think he popularized that that position, whether he came up with it or popularized it, I'm not sure. But he definitely, I, I, I'm for sure he did popularize it. I like what Roundtree said earlier too. A lot of these statements, they sound good, but there's no text to back them up, right? There's no biblical text mm -hmm. that says that. I, I know one guy that says like, uh, Jesus would never live in a haunted house. How could a demon and Jesus live in the same place? And I'm just like, oh, well, I mean, cancer is in people's body and cancer can be demonic. And there was a woman in Luke 13 had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And could God live where sickness lives? Because we have sickness in our body. Not all sickness is demonic, of course. We don't, we don't, we don't believe that all sickness is demonic, but some sickness is demonic. So how could sickness be in our body and also the Holy Spirit? I personally, we don't, we'll go on another show about that because that's a whole can of worms if we start saying, where does mm -hmm. the demon live? Is it in the soul? Is it in the spirit? Is it in the flesh? And that's another topic we could talk about some other day. But yeah, it, se it seems to be now we have a lot of statements like, well, God wouldn't share a house with a demon or with the devil and God wouldn't be in a haunted house. We have all these he great did. sounding statements. He did though. Like that's like, if you literally go yeah, to the That's the crazy part. Jesus, Jesus calls the Pharisees sons of Satan. He, mm. he tells them, like, like if, if they would have known, they wouldn't have crucified the king of glory. He's talking about the principalities and powers like Paul does, right? Like, 
he was hanging out with high priests in the temple, in the like in the yeah. synagogues where demons were hanging out. He goes into the synagogues and the demons cry out. He was literally hanging out in haunted houses. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we actually have a text that says, "No, you're wrong." That's yeah, silly. so and they they sound good and to the un maybe biblically illiter literate person that only gets the Bible from a PowerPoint on Sunday for ninety minutes would say, "Oh, that sounds great," and that alleviates the idea that. I might need deliverance or the people in my church might de need deliverance. And it's a massive cop out. We know deliverance takes time, energy, effort, patience, work. And to me, it's like, and I'm not trying to take a cheap shot at pastors because, you know, I pastored for no, 10 years it, and the struggle's real, but it's like, yeah, yeah, I can go golf on Saturday or I can deal with people and do deliverance and it takes hours and time. And a lot of pastors would like, hey, I'll meet you at the first, you know, the first tee, as opposed to having to deal with the demonic it is a lot of work and you don't make any money off it and you don't get any accolades for it and nobody's patting you on the back for spending eight hours with four different people from your church on Saturday on your day off to cast out demons, but it's a lot of work and hey, welcome to ministry. This is what you signed up for. If you don't like people, you shouldn't be a pastor. You shouldn't be in ministry. I just think I, I, I'm praying that more pastors would sign up and say, I will fight for people. I will do the dirty work. And it takes a lot of effort. So, so yeah, it's not You'll easy. appreciate this, Isaiah. I won't let someone be an, an elder in my church if they don't know what their gift is and how to use it because uh, we we're a word and spirit church, right? It's good. But they also need to know how to cast out demons because that's what we do. It's good. I don't counsel, counsel because I don't consider myself a professionally trained counselor. However, I have authority over demons. I know how to help people get free from that. And so that's yeah. very normative at my church for the elders to actually take appointments and pray with people. It's good. We need that. I'm going to ask you guys one last question and then I'm going to get you guys off because I know you guys have like four or five minutes and you guys have stuff that you, you've you pre-planned, which we'll do another episode. We had about 20 questions. I think we got through three or four, which were great, but I knew I knew okay. we were going to get through all of these. I would love to hear quickly your guys' thoughts on, I'm curious. I'm not even asking for the audience or like to try to have a teaching moment. I'm just genuinely curious. I kind of ask everybody about this when it comes to deliverance because I'm in the middle here. The origin of demons, you know, the two main arguments are like fallen angels versus <laughs> I know I'm opening up Pandora's box. We'll go quick. Uh, you don't have to give the whole reason why you believe it or the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. What are your guys's quick general thoughts on what are demons? What's I don't even the origin? know. I don't think we agree. Do we agree on this? Let's find some disagreement. Finally, after an hour, let's figure see. It out. Let's figure it out. Go ahead, Miller. You first. Uh, I am in favor of the departed Nephilim. Okay. Uh, view. I think that's quite possible. Uh, I also think there there could be a number of different ways that this happens. Like I think the fallen angels is also a possibility. Uh, I think both are true. In fact, I okay. just think you're dealing with different kinds. The the, the fact that they're called unclean uh, that that very much is like the food laws. Like these things are unclean because they're mm. they're crossing boundaries, right? Certain uh, animals were off limits because whether they're land or or sea, like a lobster, we don't really know because it sort of walks along the bottom, right? So you see that these things are sort of considered unclean because they cross boundaries. Well, this unclean union of a man and a woman, I mean, an angel and a woman, creates these unclean offspring that were, uh, you know, not supposed to be. And then uh, on top of that, they end up being the false teachers. And you see the, uh, the angels are held in underground caverns of the, the earth. But in the same passage that's being quoted there in Second Peter, uh, he's quoting from the book of Enoch. And it's likely that uh, the, say, the other thing about Enoch, about what happens to the departed Nephilim, is, is what's happening to these. Uh, Miller, these can I just ask a question of clarification? Would you say you know that's what they are? Are you saying it's fun to speculate? That's what I think are they are. It's what you think they are. Okay. I'm yeah. just, and that's where, I that's don't where. Know. Get him. Yeah, I'm get him. dogmatic stance. He asked me like a hobby horse yeah. here, right? Like I, I have no idea. Yeah. That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. think. No, I think it's great. I just, yeah, yeah. we're we going to go into your explanation. Michael people can be it. taking these clips. I'm defending you, my guy. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Michael, like, yeah, he's saying that. Oh, trust Michael me. Michael we're giving Michael lots of clips. Michael Miller believes it. Yeah, if Heiser says it, I believed it. You said Heiser Miller believes it? So I'm going to say, first of all, it's all a guess for all of us because nobody knows. And so yep. we can have the theolo theological humility to admit that. Second of all, I would, I would say I think they're probably not departed spirits of the Nephilim. I mean, that's rooted in, I think, some Second Temple literature postulates that that's the case. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're right because Second Temple literature is not the Bible. Um, it does help us understand culturally kind of how they thought through things. But, it, uh, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt. 
a couple of things that I think might argue against it. Uh, I'm thinking about, well, for one, in Revelation 9, uh, it talks about an army of 200 million, which almost every interpreter understands to be demons, yeah. to be released in the last days. Now, numbers in apocalyptic literature are, are almost never like, okay, so Michael's interpretation, Literal. but they're usually not literal okay and that's actually not just michael's that's just true of apocalyptic literature numbers are usually not literal but if they're symbolic they're symbolic of something and i'm pretty sure 200 million is symbolic of something massive a massive last days outpouring of evil spirits on the earth that's revelation chapter 9 uh, the sixth trumpet i guess it is and um and so if, if it is departed spirits of the Nephilim, how many Nephilim were there? <laughs> were there 200 million? Or even if it was just, a, you know, even if it was just like a symbolic number, which it was, like, were there just Nephilim everywhere? No, it seems like when you read the biblical account. They were like rabbits there were, around tree. <laughs> there was some Nephilim, but I mean, there were Nephilim everywhere. Okay, so that's one. Another one, Luke 13, um, it talks about a woman who has a spirit of disability that bent her back over double. But then Jesus also says Satan has, uh, you know, Satan is the one who bent her back over double. So Satan, spirit of disability, there's a strong association between Satan and demons. Same with Matthew yeah. 12. Satan is called the prince yep. of demons. Why does that matter? Um, it, matters because like revelation 12 it talks about um you know michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels and so it seems as though and i'm piecing together stuff and it, and it might not work perfectly um but it seems as though satan is the head of all fallen angels and if if we can carry that parallel over to something like luke 13 uh or matthew 12 where you see Satan as being the prince over spirits. Like, what I'm trying to say is, Revelation 12, he's the leader of fallen angels. Matthew 12, Luke 13, he's a leader over evil spirits. It seems like there's a parallel between fallen angels and evil spirits. So that's probably what I would say, rather than the spirits of fallen Nephilim. It's good. It's really good. Yeah, said, we'll do another episode we'll really open up the debate here because i'm sure. i'm in the middle but what do you think yeah about? i think it's both well i i would i would say that like for the audience this is par partially a teaching moment partially my opinion first timothy 1 4 talks about not going on about myths and endless genealogies and devoting yourself to speculation so i think on these issues we're all carrying this with a an ounce of hum not an ounce hopefully a bunch of humility saying we don't know the bible's not exhaustive on this subject we are trying to make sense of it, but you don't want to make mountains out of molehills and you don't want to be following ministries. They're like, their whole thing is talking about yeah. the origin of humans and like the origin of it doesn't matter as much as our authority over it. Right. And, yeah, and they're dead. Rid of it. Their origin doesn't matter as much as the final destination, right? The lake of fire is where they all go. And in the midst of that, the time that we have now, we have authority over them. That's, what's really important. So we we'll want to remind the audience of that. But then subsequently I, I would, I almost, want to I, I i spent time in an anglican church and i'm just way more comfortable with mystery now than i ever have been and i'm okay with saying the bible doesn't tell me i don't have to know and just go i don't know like I, the bible doesn't say that there are zebras but i believe there are zebras right like i just sometimes the bible doesn't tell me things and i'm just okay with saying the world is a very complex uh place but I do believe the scripture is sufficient to tell me everything I need to know. And if there's not a level of perspicuity on this issue, I'm just okay with not knowing and just leaving it up to mystery. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable there. Yep, that's really good. And I think a point that Roundtree made, oh, he didn't verbally say it, but what the scriptures he gave made, is there's different types of fallen angels in different places. Some are under Euphrates River that get released in Revelation. Some of them are already held in chains. Some of them are on the earth. Some of them are in the second heaven. And so I think there is, like you said, so much mystery as to where are all these demons, who's under what control and what ranking. And I think if we get lost in it, we get lost in it. And it takes away from the point of let's just cast our demons. Regardless of who they are, where they are, what their name is, Amen. let's cast them out. That's what we're called to.
But I agree with you, Miller. I'm in the middle as well. I think they're both. <laughs> I think they're both. No, I, I'm definitely interested about the topic, but it's not something I'm, you know, yeah. I'm going to spend hours and hours on. Let's. Uh, it I is know that, fun, man. Yeah, it is. And we're going to definitely do a part two if you guys would want to come back on. I know the time went fast. It's already been an hour and 10 minutes. We got started late because my AirPods weren't working, so I had to restart my computer. If you'll let the audience know, though, where they can find each of you or any kind of like shout out or plug you want to give, and then I'll stay, I'll get you guys off and I'll stay on and they can give and all that stuff after and I'll text you guys when I'm done. But yeah, where could they find you guys if they want to find more content, more Remnant Radio? Remnant Radio. Yeah, so uh, theremnantradio.com is the place to get all of our links. Uh, we have a newsletter on there. If you're out there and you're like, man, you quoted a lot of stuff about the early church fathers, cessationism. We have a newsletter. When you subscribe to that newsletter, you get like a 72-page document for free. That is just like our whole response to the cessationist documentary. Uh, we talk about deliverance and healing and we talk about prophecy, all that stuff. So if you just want like really like Bible verses and quotes of church fathers, and you just want to be like, like have an overwhelming mountain of evidence of why we're on the right side of history and theology when it comes to the spiritual gifts. Uh, I would really encourage you just subscribe to the newsletter there on remnant radio, go remnantradio.com. It's in the description of every one of our YouTube videos, the newsletters there, uh, at least all the newer ones, because we got a marketing director who knows what she's doing. So uh, <laughs> awesome. uh, she put those in all the new ones, all the old ones. And then there's a thousand links, but uh, yeah, we, we, all of our information for our churches can be found on our website. That's really the best one-stop shop, theremnantradio.com. Well, I'll say this tonight, guys. Not only was it a great show, but we blessed all the heresy hunters. We gave them so much content to react to. Throughout so the next week, there will be so many clips and videos of Remnant Wait. Radio joins fa false prophet Isaiah Saldivar <laughs> and agrees. This is a thumbnail. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, no. <Yeah>. And, agree <laughs> and agrees agrees that Christians can have demons. Heretics, yeah. heretics. So, yeah, hopefully they'll get more than 80 views on the videos they make. But here we are. Dang. I appreciate you guys, and I had a great time with you guys. I'd love to do it again. Sorry we did go a few minutes over. I told them, hey, we'll try to land it around 7.15 here, and it's 7.20. But thank you guys for being on. I'll text you guys after. I definitely Pleasure. want to sow into your guys' ministry. And everyone, please make sure you guys subscribe to them down below. And then I will link the two episodes that go in great depth and go much deeper, and uh, you'll feel like me when I listen to Remnant Radio. I feel dumb. I'm like, I don't know half the stuff they're talking about, but amen, I agree. They're way smarter than me. Um, We're just reading yeah. books. We didn't make any of it up. We just awesome. Yeah, this yeah. isn't our... We didn't make any of it. <laughs> We're plagiarizing yeah. everything, Isaiah. Don't awesome. for a second think we're smarter than you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you guys for being on. I'm definitely going to have you guys back on soon. Yeah, All anytime, right. man. God bless you guys. Take care. All right, guys, what an amazing episode. I want to challenge you guys to sow into their ministry. They didn't ask for anything. They never do. Mo Actually, all the guests I have on don't ask for anything, just so you know. But I want to sow into it, so into them because it's the right thing to do. I hope you guys enjoyed this. What do they call it? Collab? Is that what it's called? This collab that we had, it was great. And I started out a relationship with them criticizing me. Now we're friends. So who knows? Your critics might become your friends. Who knows? Glad to have them on. I thought it was great. The links to give are right there. And also you can scan the QR code. On Thursday, we have our partner prayer meeting at 1.30 p.m. We're also going to be live again Thursday at noon. So you don't want to miss Thursday at noon. I have an idea of a stream. We'll see if I do it on Thursday. We'll see what happens. But yes, Thursday at noon, we'll be live. And then we'll have our prayer call at 1.30 p.m. for monthly partners. So if you want to get involved in that prayer call, become a YouTube member. You hit join. Or go to my website and become a monthly partner for any amount. Helps us out a lot and you get an invite to that prayer meeting. Plus you get 70 sermons if you sign up. 20% off the merch store and all that good stuff. And you support the ministry. So thank you. All right. So let me open it up to you guys to give. And then if you have any questions, you can comment. They were on a time schedule as well because they had some stuff pre-planned. And so I want to honor their time. You guys already know me. I will go three hours. I'll go, you know... If you guys were in the beginning days of our podcast, we would go two to three hours every week. And then I realized that I was inviting people on and they didn't want to come on because they're like, uh, can we go like an hour instead of three hours? So I stopped doing the three hour podcast. It is a lot to try to take in three hours. Sometimes it feels exhausting for people after listening to three hours. So yeah, the one hour mark is the sweet spot. Sometimes we go over with four guys you know, one hour short, we could probably go two hours pretty easy because there's four people you're splitting the time with. But I thought it was a great time nonetheless, and I appreciate having them on. And I hope you guys subscribe and check out their channel. One of the things we try to do on this podcast is be a platform for other people to grow and all that good stuff. So yeah, three hours is fun. Hey, I feel it. I feel it. I'm a fan of the three hour podcast. 
great podcast host. Thank you, Marcella. I'm working on it. I'm trying to learn how to be a good host. I even now started making questions and outlines and making a little bit more, you know, a little bit better, a little bit better. We're working on it. We're on episode 168. And we're still learning. Also, I'm going to be in Antioch, California this Saturday. So I hope you're going to be there. That's February 24th, this Saturday, Antioch, California. Info's on my website. I'll post a flyer tomorrow. March 3rd, I'll be preaching at my home church, Life Song, in Stockton for five services. Thank you, Radar Apologetics. Guys, go subscribe to Radar Apologetics. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you in the chat. Um, July 19th through the 21st, revivalinthedesert.com. I'll be in Washington. September 14th, Alabama. September 15th, Georgia. October 27th, the Now Arena in Chicago. Is that date right? Somebody told me, corrected me. Did I fix that? Let me check, chat. Hold on. July, August, September, October. No, it's wrong. Ew, feels bad. I keep saying that wrong. It's October 26th, the Now Arena in Chicago. Ooh, I need to fix that on my master notes. Okay, that's wrong. But anyways, I'll be at the Now Arena in Chicago. This Saturday, I'll be in Antioch, California. I'd love to meet you. Love to have you come out. That would be great. And then, of course, we're live Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at noon. Listen, we're just trying to ride the algorithm. I don't know. The podcast has been, the numbers have been rough lately. It is what it is. YouTube, I mean, Facebook, I'm basically red account. So both my accounts get are restricted only people that can watch are those that go to my channel. So we're basically just on YouTube now for the most part doing like reaching people on YouTube. So it is what it is. We're just going to keep riding the wave. Some weeks there's 5,000. Some weeks there's 1,000. Don't matter. As long as I got some of you guys, uh, a couple of you guys, a hundred of you guys, then that's great. That's great. I'm happy with a hundred people. It is what it is. There's always more than that, but hey, a lot of the stuff is in the hands of the algorithm. Okay, guys. So 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 i can sew into them regardless of what you guys give maybe i shouldn't say this uh, i'm gonna give to them regardless of what you guys give but i'm gonna go over and above what comes in i'll give more than that towards their ministry and we really appreciate it so there you guys go give don't dine and dash are you gonna preach in la i preached in southern california three weeks ago in san bernardino so you missed it unfortunately didn't receive the uh email with info raquel Type your email right now. I'll send it to you again. Check your spam box as well. Every person that monthly partners on my website gets an email. So a personal email. Maybe it went to your spam. Maybe it was blocked. But yeah, Raquel, please right now type your email so I can send it to you tonight. That would, I'd much appreciate that. All right. So I'll wait for Raquel to type her email. Mods, if you see it and I don't see it, spam it. Post it again. Let us know your email, Raquel, so I can send you that tonight. Very important. Please be respectful or you will meet the ban hammer. Yeah, I don't know who's out of line, but we are not afraid of smacking people with the ban hammer. We will ban you back into 1990. Once you're banned, I don't go and unban people. So if you got banned, the mods probably banned you for a reason. We're pr pretty tolerable. So you probably said something really crazy for us to ban you. All right, but Raquel, Mandy said I got the email. Good. I hope to see you guys Thursday at 1.30. I'm going to post a reminder and send out a reminder email this week, but I hope to see you guys. And again, you guys can give there on screen and you can also become a monthly partner. That helps a lot. What a great show. We had almost 2,000 on tonight, which is great. Excuse me, which is great. I do want to hit that 10,000 though. Again, we've hit 10,000 three or four times. Sometimes you just get crazy algorithm. You just, you go. So we got to figure out the algorithm right now. We got to get on that wave. Still haven't got an email. Okay, I'm going to email you. Again, check your spam. So I got yours, Vicky Smith. I'll send that email again tonight. And Raquel, I haven't got, I haven't seen your email. Does anyone, does anyone see it? Yeah, Radar, we've had it ten thousand four times, and we've had seven, eight thousand a few times, but ten thousand live. Yeah, the algorithm changes though, so we haven't hit that. I don't know, six or seven months. Hopefully, we can hit that again someday. Who knows? All right, Raquel, did I miss your email? I really want to get that. Because I want to make sure you have the email to the invite for Thursday. All right. Still haven't got it, Raquel. But yes, hopefully you can post that soon. Is that a pigeon by you? Oh, no, that's a dove. That's not a pigeon. That's an anointed Holy Ghost dove. All right. Saw a Demon Slayer movie out, but it was an anime. Hey, we do have a movie called Come Out in Jesus' Name on Amazon Prime. And we also have another movie called The Domino Revival, which is not in digital yet, but it will be soon. See you this Saturday, Carlos. Awesome. Are you more of a cat or a dog person, cat person? 
And then Raquel, please let me know your email. Because I haven't got it yet. Diane, thank you. Raquel said Raquel can join Discord and I can send it to her if she DMs me. Yeah, I haven't seen her email yet. Email sent twice? Okay. I haven't seen your email yet in the comments, Raquel. Type it again. Mods, we've missed it. I'm looking at every comment, Raquel. So just type it one more time. Maybe it's blocking it on YouTube. Hmm. YouTube might be blocking it. If I watch paranormal stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't watch anything paranormal unless it's Christian. Anointed Holy Ghost Dove. So good. Yeah, this is Anointed Holy Ghost Dove. I'm not sure what's happening to your emails, Raquel. They're not... I mean, your comments of the email, they're not coming through. Domino Revival's fire. Yes, it was. Great show tonight. Yeah, we don't see the email. I think it's getting blocked on YouTube. Uh, maybe try to, like, space out where it says at or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll just keep waiting and looking for it. For some reason, I think YouTube's blocking it. Maybe you can comment once the video's over and I'll check the comments right away. I'm trying to think of how we can get that. Oh, YouTube's blocking it because it thinks it's a link. Yeah, probably. Try to do just your email and then like space, 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 at space, space, space or something. I don't know. Uh, Discord is free. It doesn't cost anything. Thank you guys for monthly partnering, sewing and partnering and sewing and partnering and all that good stuff. Thank you. Anime is demonic. I would say not all anime. Put spaces between your words, Raquel. Okay, we're going to work out her email. Type at instead of the symbol. That sounds good. Leave a space in the email. You guys are awesome. We got my tech support here. We got no hint water tonight, guys. We can't afford it. You know, times have been hard with the ministry, so we're just going to have to rely on Costco water, but we're going to save up some money and we'll be able to get hint water soon. All right. Thank you, guys. Times are hard, so we don't have any hint water. I'm just kidding. That's not true. Joke, joke, joke. We have hint water. I just didn't bring any in the office. Opinion on the movie star? I don't know what that is. What's the movie star? I love church. Awesome. Thank you so much for your live stream and your videos. You helped me in my journey. Want to have a closer relationship with Christ. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, yeah, tonight I won't read the Venmo or the cash out, but you could still give. I'm just not going to read them out loud. I want to talk to the chat tonight and then... I will be able on Thursday. I'll read and all that stuff and hang out with you guys. I think this community I've been needing. Isaiah, I've always enjoyed your videos. I'm here for the glory of God and brighten my life. 16 months sober. Let's go, Mandy. Thank you for being here. Join the Discord, Mandy. We have a great community. How many are in Discord, Diane, right now? Uh, email Diane. Thank you so much, Diane. Yeah, email Diane, Raquel, and she'll send you the link. And if you could forward me Raquel's email, that'd be good, too. I don't know why I'm not seeing her Raquel's comments. I only saw two of them so far from her. So it's unfortunate. There it goes. I'm doing spaces and nothing. Yeah, it's not coming through. So Raquel, Diane's email's right there. Go ahead and email her because there's no way for me to message you on YouTube. 8,500 on Discord right now. We have 8,500 people in our Discord community. So that's a big church. We literally have a church on Discord. 8,500 members. Go join the Discord. It's blocking it. Okay. So email Diane, she put her email there and she'll get it to you. She'll send you the part, thank the partner, the whole email that I send out to people when they partner, she should have it. She'll send you that. All right. Thank you so much, Diane. You're awesome. Are you coming to Arizona soon this year, but not soon. I tried hint water. Listen, I'm selling a lot of hint water out here. Hint, get the hint. I need some sponsorship. How am I, how am I like showing your guys' water on all my streams and I don't have any type of sponsorship deal? What's going on here? Thanks for coming to San Bernardino. It was fire. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Raquel. Awesome. We're going to get it worked out, Raquel. Message me on Instagram if not, and I'll get it worked out. And then the other person, I'll send it as well. Thanks, Isaiah, for the stream. You're welcome, Elise. What happened to the canned water? Oh, the proud source. Yeah, I've just been, you know, like I said, times are hard out here. Costco, Kirkland. Watching you from Ghana, West Africa. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, everybody needs to email Hint Water and say, where is Isaiah's sponsorship at? I don't understand. To be honest, 
a lot of companies aren't going to sponsor or partner with me because of my outspokenness about certain issues. So it is what it is. It's a brand risk for them. They're like, hey, we're sponsoring this guy and he's over here speaking out against gay marriage, talking out against the government, saying all these crazy things about demons. I get it. It's all good. If I was a woke secular company, I wouldn't sponsor me either. Preach. Thank you, Daniel. So we appreciate your family. Love to have you at the church soon. I appreciate you, Daniel. Thank you. I'll smoke you in pickleball. Christian soldier. You want to talk that talk, brother? Come out to the Central Valley and come see me. Come see me, bro. I play in Modesto. Griseida. Come smoke me at pickleball. I played today. I'm not going to lie. I'm not being arrogant or cocky or pr prideful or anything. I text Jared today. I'm getting pretty good, y'all. Today was the first day that I was like, after playing for what, five, six months? I've been playing since October. Today, I was playing pretty good. I felt good. I was like, hey, I'm actually getting good at pickleball. We're almost ready to release a video. So if you want to come talk that smack and smoke me at pickleball, Griseida. Come out to Modesto and play at Griseida. You'll see me out here. See what you got. Let me know what rating you are. If you don't know your rating, then uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't think you're going to smoke me, brother. When I ask people their rating, they're like, what's that? I'm like, yeah, you're definitely not going to smoke me. Not to be arrogant or anything, you know, I'm just saying. When I would travel, I would say, oh, I fish. And they would say, oh, I fish too. And I'm like, oh, what's your favorite What's your favorite rig to throw? What do you like to throw? And if they didn't know what a wacky rig was, Texas rig, Senko, Ned rig, drop shot, it's a different type of level here. There's levels to this. You don't, you don't really fish on that level like I used to. You know what I'm saying? My rating is 100. That's not a rating in pickleball. So unfortunately, that's not a rating. I'm still waiting, though, for that rating. Let's see. Who was the one that called me out and said they were going to spank me? Let's see. Oh, smoke me. They were going to smoke. Christian Soldier. I'm still I'm still waiting, brother, on the rating. Top water. Come on, Jared. You already know. The Whopper Plopper. You don't know what a Whopper Plopper is, and you're a bass fisherman. You're fishing at the ponds, brother. You're hunting at the zoo, if you know what I mean. We're on different levels, brother, if you don't know what a Whopper Plopper is. But it's okay. Not everybody could be, you know, obsessed with things like me. How do you get your dove to stay still? He's just a great boy. We just pet him once in a while like this. We just pet the top of his head and he just stays still and watches the stream. Just a little rub on the top of the head and he's chilling. All right. Yeah, it's awfully quiet from Christian Soldier after he said he was going to smoke me. It's awfully quiet. Haven't saw any comments. I don't think the mods banned him, did they? It's getting awfully quiet over here. You were going to try to put me in your pickleball pipe and smoke me, but I don't know. I'm still waiting on the rating. I'm a 4-5 in pickleball. Diane, don't lie. You are not a 4-5. You're a 2.5 rating? Oh, okay. Yeah, brother. I'll teach you a thing or two. No, no, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to dunk on you. But, uh, yeah, if you're a 2.5, we could definitely play for fun. But that you definitely will not smoke me. I'll just tell you right now. It's been awfully quiet. I'm competitive, y'all. I'm just going to tell you right now. When I play, I play to win. You know what I'm saying? We don't do none of that funsies. None of that. We're playing We're playing for serious. All right. Anyway, Holy Spirit, come back. Yeah, Diane, I know you're not 4-5. Come on now. What's the difference between body, soul, and spirit? This is your body, the physical body. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. And your spirit is where... Holy Spirit. If you're if you're saved, you have a perfect spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. Is alive almost over? Yes. I'm going to rant and rave and talk out of the side of my neck for five more minutes, and then I'm going to get off. Just got here. You got to rewind. It was a great show. Uh, in Jesus' name, stop ignoring me. I need the partner link. I'm a partner. Miranda, uh, Diane, will you put your email again? Because YouTube's blocking their emails. So, Miranda, if you signed up tonight, you'll get an email tonight. And if you haven't got an email, then email Diane and she'll send it to you. Do you still have the bobblehead? You know I do. Come on now. There you go. There's the bobblehead. Yeah, Diane, will you put your email again, please? And then I will... 
You can email Diane. This proves people can lose salvation because the Holy Spirit, the dove, left, but can come back if one repents. Preach, brother. Yes, I'm competitive. All right, email Diane Stevens, IC at gmail.com. Diane Stevens, I C, the letter I, the letter C at gmail.com. She'll send you the. If my email got blocked and went to your spam or just you didn't get it for whatever reason, she'll send it to you. Uh, favorite music to listen to while working out? <laughs> well, I mean, you got to work out to be able to answer that question. Then I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen, if you could put, put two and two together. Let's just say, uh, you know, my biceps are, are covered for a reason. Let's just say that. There's long sleeve on for a reason. No. All right. Okay. I should probably get off here because at this point, we're talking about working out. This is probably the point where... You know what's weird? We had 900 people. Now we have 1,100. So people are randomly popping on right now. I don't know what's going on. You're late to the show. Pickleball is working out. Yeah, it's good cardio. It... It's good cardio. I probably burned a couple thousand calories today. I played, I won't tell you how long I played this morning, but I played for a long time. I burned a couple thousand calories. And I've probably taken in today, like, uh, maybe 300 calories, and I've probably burned, like, close to 3,000, maybe. Again, I won't tell you how many hours I played. You can do the math. Let's just say I'm negative about 2,000 calories today. So I should probably eat something before I fall over. Just turned on. Yeah, I don't know why a bunch of people just logged on. A couple hundred people just joined randomly. So I don't know if we're on like the recommended feed somehow or I don't know. But unfortunately, we're about to end. Favorite movie of all time? Come out in Jesus' name and Domino Revival. That's the right answer, right? I always laugh while you talk. I'm glad, Marissa. Thank you. Bro, how? So how? How what? How did I burn thousands of calories playing pickleball for a lot of hours? <laughs> yeah, about that. Thanks for streaming. Always learning the most here. Thanks, Lauren, for being here. No, I haven't watched The New Chosen. I have not watched it. I have not gone to the theater and watched it. Maybe I'll watch it when it's out of theaters. Jared, I see you, bro. Advice to new Christians, develop a prayer life. You will not survive if you don't pray every day. Develop a prayer life. The word and prayer, the word and prayer. Those are your two assignments. Amazing teaching. Keep the fire going. Thank you, Christian. Three hours. More. I'll just say more or less. You guys can guess. More than three hours. Up. Up. When are you going to join Pastor Mike at noon? I should, right? You're, look at this. Your YouTube ministry got me out of cessationism. Let's go. Set free from the prison of cessationism. Praise the Lord, brother, that God set you free from that prison that says God isn't moving like he did before. Uh, four hours. More. Please do a teaching on the fatherless. Five hours. More. Hotter. Seven hours. We'll just leave it at that, maybe. Are you going to be, be at the marriage conference? I'm not sure which one you mean. More than three? Yeah, more than three hours. Yeah, more than four hours. And I'm talking straight, y'all. I sat down once for like four minutes. My feet are sore. Let's just say around seven hours. But who's who's counting? I don't know. I didn't have... I wasn't sitting there counting. I didn't have like a stopwatch on. It wasn't like I was sitting there like, oh, I'm about to hit marks at seven hours. I should probably uh, go home and pray and, and get ready. Who knows? 
You need some protein? Uh, does Taco Bell count? If I get off here and order Taco Bell, would you guys judge me? Or is it time to get off? I mean, is that like, should I not get off here and order Taco Bell? Is that something I shouldn't do? Let me know in the chat. You could have been praying for seven hours straight. Marcel, you know I stayed praying. I'm out there in the pickleball court slamming the ball in Jesus' name. Dinking in Jesus' name. Third shot drops in Jesus' name. Praying without ceasing. You know what I'm saying? Stay in the spirit. A lot of time to pray in the Holy Ghost while playing pickleball. You know what I'm saying? Stay on, don't go. Uh, unfortunately, I should go. Went from working out to talk about. It's time to get off. Do you run as fast as you preach? I'm pretty fast. I need the gift of your metabolism. Yeah. Honestly, you probably just need the gift of not having an appetite. Because I could not eat and not care. I The first time I ate today was at 4 o'clock. And I ate something that was probably like 200 calories. And uh, I didn't even care. I'm like, oh, oh well. I need to see a video of you running. Laughing face. It's probably as funny as it, you think. Are you a 5'5"? Five five? No, no, no. I'm not right. I'm not 5'5". Five five. I'm probably like a 3.5, a 4. 3.54. I was playing with a bunch of guys today that were 4s, and I was I was doing good. So I would say 3.5, 4. Somewhere around there. It depends. No one really knows. Ratings are kind of whatever, but yeah, around there. I'm definitely not like that good. You and Jared should race. Uh, he'd probably win. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Salute. I love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Amazing night. Thanks for being here. Thanks for staying. And we will see you guys on Thursday at noon and then 1.30 p.m. prayer. If you are a monthly partner on a YouTube or on my website, you need to be at 1.30 prayer. This is your father speaking. This is your father speaking. You need to be at prayer at 1.30 p.m. Stop skipping prayer. 1.30 p.m. Oh, love you guys and appreciate you guys. I got to go find something to eat. I'll see you guys Thursday at noon. God bless. Love y'all. Bye. Oh, hey, didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Super easy, super free, helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you're doing, hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. Love y'all. Thanks for being here. Oh, that was loud. Sorry. Love you guys. Thanks for being here. My speakers aren't working. Why are my speakers not working? Oh, I know why. Sorry. Just talking to myself. Nothing to see here. Here we go. Here we go. We're going to fix it. Let's see. There we go. Good night, Carl. What time zone? Pacific. I'm in California. Everything will be Pacific time. See you guys Thursday. Go eat, I will. This is for all the cats out there that just love to see the bird on the TV. Come for the preaching, stay for the pigeons, right? In and out? Nah, I don't like In and Out. I burned myself out years ago on that. All right, good night, guys.